secular and socialist, these two words have stared back at us for two generations from the preamble of the Constitution. Now the Supreme Court has decided to hear a plea calling for the deletion of these words from the preamble. Not many know that they were written into the Constitution only in 1976, and that too under the cover of the emergency. Needless to say, this act by the Indira Gandhi government attracted a lot of controversy as her government did not enjoy popular legitimacy after its suspended rights of Indian citizens. Basic rights, viewers. It incarcerated, her government that is, incarcerated several political opponents, muzzled entirely the press. So it was quite unpopular. Now, viewers, the pleas before the Supreme Court list a variety of reasons to call for the removal of these two terms. The first and foremost being that the two words inserted in the preamble violated the basic structure doctrine enunciated in the famous Kesavananda Bharti judgment by the 13 judge bench in 1973. That judgment barred parliament from tinkering with the basic structure or the features of the constitution. Those opposed to the move have lashed out at the petitioners, accusing them of turning India away from the path of secularism and desecrating the ideals of the constitution. Of course, the framers of the constitution were themselves against including these terms in the constitution. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was opposed to adding the words secular and socialist to the preamble in the constituent assembly. He said in November 1948, what should be the policy of the state, how the society should be organized in its social and economic side are matters which must be decided by the people themselves according to time and circumstances. It cannot be laid down in the constitution itself because that is destroying democracy altogether. If you state in the constitution that the social organization of the state shall take a particular form, you are in my judgment taking away the liberty of the people to decide what should be the social organization in which they wish to live." Unquote. That's really why these two words didn't figure till 1976 in the preamble of the Constitution. Now, viewers, let's open this up because Vishnu Shankar Jain, who's an advocate, and we know him because he's been fighting cases in different contexts, has decided to challenge the insertion of these two words. Sanjay Hegde, another senior advocate of the Supreme Court, is also here with us. Both these individuals quite distinguished in their own right, and we hope to have an in-depth conversation on the desirability of going ahead with this particular move. Now, first of all, Mr. Jain, you moved this plea along with, of course, a couple of other notables. Uh, what is motivating you to remove these two words? How do you believe they are prejudicial to democracy, for instance, as Dr. Ambedkar seemed to suggest? See, first of all, Rahul, the very, very crucial point is that this proposal to insert the word secular and socialist was introduced by Professor K. T. Shah three times, and the dates are on 15th of November 1948, 25th of November 1948, and 3rd of December 1948. And all on, on all three times, this proposal was rejected by the Constitutional Assembly, and this thing is noted in the Constitutional Assembly debates in volume 7, page number 597 to 605. So, these proposals introduced by K.T. Thomas, uh, K.T. Shah were rejected. That is point number one. Point number two, which is very, very distingu uh, distinguishing feature is this, that our constitution and, and the preamble specifically comes up with a date and at the end of the preamble it is written that we on this 26th day of November 1949 do hereby adopt, enact and give to ourselves this constitution. So, it was an oath which was taken by people of India on 26th of November 1949. And at that time, the word social and secular were not inserted. So, if something has been done in a form of an oath on a particular date, how can it be changed retrospectively? 
and my third point is that the emergency was proclaimed in this country on 25th of June 1975 and this 42nd amendment was passed during emergency and the date is 2nd of November 1976 and the last point is that secular and socialist word when it was inserted there was no debate upon it, it was never defined and therefore it is completely a dichotomous, a dichotomous situation where anything has been introduced in the constitution without even defining it. Secular and socialist word have not been defined and let me tell you and I support the view of Mr. Ambedkar that you cannot force a particular individual to be bound by a particular ideology. What is the ideology of secularism? What is the ideology of socialism? Do we know it? Has it been defined by the parliamentarians did, uh, till date? Has it been, uh, there has been koi kya parliament mein kabhi iske liye koi sarthak debate hui? There has been none. So okay. that's the ground of challenge on which we have challenged it before the Supreme Court, yes. Okay, let, let me bring in Mr. Hegre on this point. Mr. Hegre, first of all, do you believe that the plea deserves not just a hearing but consideration, due consideration because of the reasons that uh, our friend Vishnu Jain Saab has elucidated upon? Well, whether it will be considered or not is entirely a matter of the for the judges. I'm not a judge. But uh, this is what I'd like to say. What I'd like to first tell you is that the 42nd Amendment came in, uh, it was brought in in January 1977. In December 1977, you had the 44th Amendment, which was brought in by the subsequent Janta government. The Janta government included Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Lal Krishna Advani, and a Rajya Sabha member at that point of time was Subramaniam Swami, who's the petitioner now. They unanimously passed the 44th Amendment and while it undid most of the 46th Amendment, uh, the 42nd Amendment, they did not touch the words of socialist and secular. Now, socialist and secular were not put into the constitution in uh, Katie Shah's amendment because Katie Shah wanted the amendment to, to say that India that is Bharat shall be a secular federal socialist uh, union of states. He wanted to have it, it put in Article 1, the first article of the Constitution. Dr. Ambedkar, while replying to him, said, look, the Constitution, there are several provisions of in it. Most of the provisions, in, in socialism or whatever else, the structure in the directive principles of state policy and all were provided for. So that was the first reason he gave that this is not ne necessary. The second reason that he gave is my honorable friend, Professor Shah does not seem to have taken into account that, uh, you know, just one minute. There's one reason the amendment should be opposed. The second reason is that the amendment is purely superfluous. My honorable friend, Professor Shah does not seem to have taken into account that apart from the fundamental rights which we have embodied in the constitution, We've already introduced other sections which deal with the directive principles of state policy. What I'd like to ask Professor Shah is, th is this. If these directive principles to which I've drawn attention are not socialistic in their direction and in their content, I fail to understand what more socialism can be. Therefore, my submission is that these socialist principles are already embodied in this constitution and it is unnecessary to accept this amendment. So he said, look, exactly. I have put it in the constitution, everything is there. Now, the constitution says, does not make any reference to God. Hari Vishnu Kamath wanted to say in the name of God. That was also this. The constitution says that you will not discriminate between citizen and citizen on the basis of religion. The constitution says that you will not be asked to pay for any particular religion. You can't have taxes which go for. The constitution also says that there will be no untouchability that Hindu places of worship will be open for all. So it has in itself, without the preamble, the entire secular architecture in it, which is part of the basic structure, which has been held so after Keshavananda Bharati in Bombay. So now, what is it being challenged? Are you challenging the 42nd Amendment, which inserted it, or the 44th Amendment, which failed to take a to undo the insertion in amendment. its entirety. Now, if you are challenging the 42nd Amendment, 
you are about 50 years too late. The constitu constitutional amendments, if you want to challenge it, you challenge them immediately. I mean, we were not born then. Somebody else uh, uh, would have challenged it. They, uh, those challenges have, not, uh, have now more or less reached a quietus. Now, if you were, see, you have parliament. Parliament can amend almost any portion of the constitution, including the preamble, uh, as long as it does not violate the basic structure. Let's have a parliamentary exercise. You want a discussion in parliament, please discuss it. Because what one parliament did, another parliament can undo as long as it keeps the basic structure intact. Why do you want the courts after 50 years mm -hmm. to strike down? Okay, Let, let's, ask, let's ask some of these questions. Uh, Mr. Vishnu Shankar Jain, one is of course a, a kind of loose time bar. You could say 50 years too late. Why now? Why wasn't this done immediately then? And when there was an opportunity, as uh, Mr. Hegre points amendment. out in the 44th Amendment, you allowed those two words to subsist. So, is this just an exercise at political signaling? Uh, could you quickly clarify this? And then I want to build on this a little bit more. See, we yes. have a, yeah, we have a lot of regard of Mr. Hegre, and he's a senior counsel in the Supreme Court. But the fact of the matter is that the validity and constitutional validity of any act can be challenged at any point of time. So there is no question of any limitation that you have, why you have not come and why you, why didn't you come 50 years ago. If there is an act which is there uh, and it, is a, it, it has become a constitutional amendment, then you can challenge it at any point of time. There is no limitation uh, so far as that challenge is concerned because it is still subsisting till today. And let me also point out Rahul one more dichotomy. Uh, because of this word social and secular, under the representation of People Act section 29A and B, if any political party is going to be formed or the existing political parties, they have to give a declaration that they will abide by the principles of social, uh, socialist and secular. Now, what is this definition? We don't know. So, we have a party like AIMIM which is saying that yes, we will abide by the principles of secularism and if you will see the constitution of AIMIM, it is only formed for a particular community. So the question is, there are a lot of questions so far as this challenge is concerned, but the mood point is, where is the definition of words social and secular? We are not challenging the 44th amendment, we are challenging the 42nd amendment by which it was introduced in the constitution and let me tell you this preamble, preamble of this constitution came up with a particular date, it was an oath which was taken on that date. So how can you force the people of India to be social and secular by retrospective effect when the entire country was in emergency, there was no discussion in the parliament and the second point which Mr. Hegre say, says is this, that why are you discussing it in the court? I am shocked. Rahul, I am shocked because Mr. Hegre himself is a counsel in so many challenges to the constitutional questions, in so many challenges where statutory questions are involved. So everything if has to be decided by the parliament. Mr. Hegre must uh, stop arguing so far as other matters are concerned. But as a lawyer, as a citizen of this country, if there is an act of parliament, it's a duty to challenge it, to bring it within the judicial purview, to bring it within the purview of judicial review. There has to be a judicial scrutiny and that is that is what precisely our point is. Okay. And let me tell you, Mr. Hegle was saying that Subramaniam Swami is one of the petitioners. Mr. Subramaniam Swami is one of the petitioners, but there is a petition filed by me of Balram Singh, who is a practicing advocate in the Supreme Court. So it is not that you will just play upon Mr. Subramaniam Swami without dealing with the issue that this is the lead petition on which this matter has been argued and this matter okay. has been challenged. Okay, so those are two separate issues. Uh, let's come back to you, Mr. Hegre, on this point of a certain degree of ultra-virus this retrospective effect that uh, is sort of signaled by the date that this preamble was adopted. It's a very narrow point that Mr. Vishnu Jain is making, but isn't it an important one? Now, the uh, bench in Keshavananda Bharti was very clear that you could amend anything, including the preamble. So I don't think there is anything legal in the point. Okay. Right now, right now the law, I, I can only tell you the law, I can't get emotional, okay? The, the law simply is 
वाई शुड राहुल वाई शुड कोर्ट डू योर डर्टी वर्क स्टिल रिवर्बरेट इन माई माइंड ओके संजय हेगड़े ऑन योर शो Had of used course, this word why should courts that why do should courts work? do your dirty work? Exactly, yes, that. exactly. Repeat. That's the I point, repeat. Rahul. It is this mindset. It is against this mindset that we are fighting. Because when you believe in independence of judiciary and there's a challenge to the constitution and constitutional amendment, you say you deal it with a okay, relevant view of the spectrum. Okay, let me let me. Okay, let 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 Mr. Hegre. That it is supporting a particular ideology. Okay, let Mr. Hegre respond. Mr. Hegre. See, Why can't the, we get the courts to clarify minute, on this point? Just one point. minute. Just one minute. Just one minute. Firstly, uh, Vishnu, one thing is, raise your argument, not your voice. You won't go very far, uh, at least in court. Okay. Secondly, in court, the only question is, was the constitutional amendment validly passed? If it was, uh, if the procedure was valid, then does it come? Uh, is it uh, does it uh, come short of the basic structure in any way? Does it abridge the basic structure, or does it take away from the basic structure? And courts also have the discretion about rejecting petitions which have been filed a very long time, because the position often in law is that if things have been made in such in a certain way and that position has endured for a long period of time, courts do not come to interfere. Yes, a subsequent parliament can change its mind. A subsequent parliament may very well say that uh, we do not want to be a secular republic. We do not want to be a socialist republic. Okay. A subsequent so, parliament, just one minute. A subsequent parliament may decide we don't want reservations either. We want to have four. We are a four hundred seat majority, and we will amend everything in the constitution. No, true. Uh, but, that, that, that is that is equally a possibility. So, but, but hang on, but hang on. On the, the question of the limitation is the limitation is. You can't go beyond the basic structure. Okay. And the basic structure has been defined to include secularism. Okay. Do so, not socialism. Okay. So secularism has been defined within the basic structure. Now removing the word secular, let's ask the second question because, look, I mean, you know, on this point of whether the courts will look at something that has been on the books for such a such a long period of time, I think that's a debate in itself and. I think there are enough examples to suggest that the court has gone back and re-examined issues that are as old as the hills, so to speak. So let's set that aside for just a few moments, uh, that because it's more tendentious in that sense. But let me ask very clearly, both to Vishnu Shankar Jainji as well as Mr. Hegre. Uh, Vishnu Shankar Jain, the moment people move or raise the issue or make the demand that the word secular, for example, should be removed from the constitution, it immediately sets off alarm bells because a particular constituency of thought leaders, etc., will say that, look, this is a lurch towards being an exclusivist, perhaps Hindu republic or communal republic. How do you address that? And I want to bring Sanjay Hegre in right after that to also weigh in on this. Yes, Vishnu Shankar Jain. Rahul, I was, I was listening to your show mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. my very dear friend, Mr. Anand Ragnathan, had asked a very pointed, pointed question to one of the panelists about uh, the uh, fundamentals of Islam. Hmm. So the question is not about removing the word secular and socialist. The question is, can you force a particular person to believe in a particular ideology? Can you force a citizen of this country to be secular? So far as the uh, administration of government is concerned, there is already a, the, uh, the provision is there under Article 14 and 15 that the government will not discriminate between the citizens on the basis of their religion. But how can you force me to be secular? How can you force a particular person to be socialist? These are ideologies, these are political thoughts and you cannot force a particular person to believe in a particular thought. And let me also, come, uh, also uh, uh, tell my second point. Why NJSC was a constitutional amendment? Was NJSC not challenged in the Supreme Court? Was NJSC not struck down by the Supreme Court? So this point that a constitutional amendment must not be challenged in the Supreme Court, it must be debated in the parliament is completely, uh, I, am, I am shocked because this has been, so many constitutional amendments have been challenged, 102 amendments have been passed uh, so far as the constitution is concerned and many of the constitutional amendments have been tested by the Supreme Court, have been struck down by the Supreme Court. So this argument that constitutional amendment must only be discussed in the parliament is actually taking away and actually coming up with a mindset that why should courts do your dirty work? Why should courts do your dirty work? This is the mindset Rahul. 
Okay, well, one second. Let me it's just... not on the merits of the matter. Okay, well, so Vishnu Shankar Jain, I understand that you can't force anybody to be secular in their outlook, etc. And that point is perhaps a valid one. And I don't know how that will be sort of uh, looked upon by the justices. It's going to be the Chief Justice of India-led bench that is going to hear this matter in a few months from now. But I just want to ask you, what do you say to all of those people who say that you're the cat's paw for... Hindu agitators, revisionists, call them what you want to, to turn India into a Hindu Rashtra very quickly. See, it's not about turning India into a Hindu Rashtra or any other thing. Yeah. The point is very, very legal. That if these words which were inserted in the preamble, they don't have any sanction of law, they don't have any authority of law, then definitely we have a point to argue it before the Supreme Court. And let me also tell you that if the Honorable Supreme Court were to dismiss my petition, it would have dismissed it on the first day as Mr. Hegde was pointing out. So I am very sure that our research is very concrete and these words which have been inserted in the uh, okay. preamble are completely erroneous okay. and it, uh, it will be struck down okay. someday or the other. Okay, Mr. Hegre. You know, India was no less secular for 30 years before this word was put in. Now, it's an argument, of course, how you define secularism, if it means leaning to one you know, constituency of people or a denomination, then, of course, uh, you know, that's a debate that we can have. But the fact of the matter is that, at least in principle, India was no less secular for 30 years before these words, were, at least the word secular, was injected into the preamble. So removing it will not in any way have any sort of directional change to the way we view ourselves as a nation. That, that also will be a call as and when that constitutional amendment is passed. My simple point is that the courts do not get into the political thicket. That's a normal uh, rule. Courts can which, get into which, Article 370. Courts can see... نوبڈی فورسز وشنو جین ٹو بی سیکولر اور me to be unsecular or whatever. People can be as observant or as non-observant as they want. There is nothing called uh, secular uh, in personalities. The state is secular. The state says, look, irrespective of what religion you follow, or if you don't follow a religion also, I will treat you equally. I will not discriminate. I am bound constitutionally not to discriminate between my citizens. That is what is there in, uh, in the body of the constitution and that's how we as a nation go on. Now, the preamble itself was written after the constitution was passed. It was a kind of mission statement. Okay. And that is why that date came in. Now, if the preamble uh, is amended These words are added or taken away. They may not have the same impact as actually say, uh, uh, amending an article of the constitution. Okay. If the constitution were to say that I will, uh, you can discriminate to favor X community or Y community. That becomes problematic. That, that would really be a problem. Okay. So, Now, uh, so yeah. that is why I say, this is not a question for, I, and let me clarify. Every amendment, everything can be uh, petitioned in the courts, but courts are not bound to take it up. Okay. And particularly something which has been standing for so long. So the NJSC was referred to. The NJSC was immediately challenged and immediately struck down. Okay. Okay. Look, uh, viewers, we've had an informed discussion. The long and short point that uh, I think Mr. Hegre is making is that it's not incumbent really upon the courts to even legislate on this particular issue. Vishnu Shankar Jain has a different opinion on that. He says there are many issues, including political questions, tricky ones, thorny ones that the courts have actually looked at and reinterpreted to ensure that they are in tune with uh, the basic structure of the constitution. That's, that's, I think 
that's a debate, viewers, that uh, will obviously play out in the court about jurisdiction. But I think on that threshold, the court might be amenable to examine this issue. It might be on perhaps another issue that the court might reject or accept. I don't know. But I think the conversation will happen about whether these two words really uh, meet the test of uh, the basic structure. I think that's where we will have to leave it. Viewers, remember that India, as I told you, was for 30 years as secular as can be, even when these words were not, at least the word secular was not injected into the preamble, remains secular, of course. There have been many excesses that have been committed against, uh, one could argue, the majority community also in the name of secularism, which do not actually, if you really look at it, align themselves to the basic structure. But that's another conversation for another day. And I leave it at this, viewers. It's been an interesting conversation. Principally, the takeaway is that if you remove that word, as long as you don't tinker with the articles of the Constitution, it's not going to really make a difference to the outlook of our democracy. We leave it at that.